Well, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to the, um, the fifth session of the New Austrian School in Munich. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Rayo speaking at this cinema, uh, seminar. He won't be here until later in the week. Right, okay. So because that's... Uh, he could only take the weekend off. Right. So during the week, he won't, you see, he's already teaching. Right, right. Yeah, but he can take the weekend off. So he'll be here on, on Friday or Friday. Saturday. And uh, he'll be giving um, a lecture on uh, the real bills doctrine. So neither 100% reserve nor free banking a vindication of the real bills doctrine. So with that, on to Professor. Professor. Thank you, Sandeep, uh, Keith, my two lieutenants here. I welcome them. You know that they are going to be awarded the uh, degree of Doctor of Philosophy summa cum laude later this week. So I'm just making this... making this announcement to uh, make you aware that this is a very special occasion and we are looking forward to it and uh, I understand they will uh, both publish their thesis and it will be accessible through the internet or you will have hard copies I don't know the details but I hope that all you all of you will It's a little bit tight schedule what we have now, partly because of uh, uh, Professor Rayo's uh, guest lecture, and uh, but we'll we'll see how it goes. So this is just a preliminary announcement about these degrees. Also, I would like to tell you that those who have already four courses in their background, they should feel free to apply for a degree either at the bachelor's level or at the master's level. They will be required to submit a thesis as well. It doesn't have to be original. Uh, and uh, then on the basis of uh, their submission during further sessions, which we hope we'll have here in uh, Munich, they will be awarded. The, uh, <laughs> the degrees have already been printed, have been printed, right, Rudy? Rudy showed me. Uh, the, so it's just ready for you to have your name entered. We already have, of course, one graduate of the school. That's Rudy himself, if you didn't know. At the last session, Rudy was uh, awarded the degree of Master of Monetary Science. And uh, we were very happy to do that. Rudy is the most faithful and going back all the way to the very first meeting we had. Of course there was on the internet a gold standard university before, but when it comes to gold standard university live, that uh, I don't even know how many years ago it was. Rudy was there and has come ever since, hasn't missed one day and, and uh, he has contributed more than I can thank him for. So uh, let's uh, give a show of appreciation to Rudy for all his past work. <clears throat> thank you very much. I am going to give you a little introduction before 
I will come to my topic, which is lecture one uh, in your handout. But uh, there is also an introduction preceding it. Now, uh, that would take too long to go through, and I don't plan to do that. But I will lift two ideas as a, uh, by way of introduction. And then I go on uh, with lecture one. What we are trying to do here... Uh, of course, is we found it necessary to criticize what I call the mainstream Austrian school. And by that I mean mainly the uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. I sometimes refer to them as the American Austrians. Were Austrian Americans? No, I think American Austrians <laughs> is better. <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to take this very, very seriously. I emphasize it again and again that I am a great admirer of Mises. I have long believed that he is, he was the greatest economist in the 20th century and he made invaluable contribution to our science. However, he would have never called himself infallible and he wasn't. And after a long uh, self soul searching and research and um, uh, hesitation I decided many years ago that I am going to publish my criticism of Mises and it has happened over the years bits and pieces here and there but it has never been collected so the theme of this session of the new Austrian School of Ec Economics here in uh, Munich is this criticism and I have picked three general areas uh, to organize my criticism around. One is marginalism and then the theory of value and finally interest versus discount. So we'll go through this and first, it's marginalism. Now, I want to say a few words about marginalism, and I uh, felt it necessary to introduce two new words, which you won't find in the dictionary, but I think you won't find it difficult either to understand. Could you put these two? One word is what I call proto-sphere. Proto-sphere. And the other word is logosphere. Now this comes from a list, or it's in addition to a list which already exists. And I invite you to add to this list. There is such a thing as biosphere, right? Okay. Mention another one. Mm. Stratosphere. 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 Yeah. Atmosphere. There is also geosphere. 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 And there are several others, okay? You, which are in the dictionary. But these two you won't find in the dictionary for good reason for the good reason that I invented them. I felt that it was necessary, if I want to talk about marginalism, it, it was necessary for me to bring out Menger's original idea by introducing these two. So let me explain the 
uh, difference between two? Well, first of all, these are uh, disjoint spheres. There could be point. Could, could you draw two mm -hmm. circles tangent uh, from the outside? And a point where they touch. Oh. <laughs> well, anyhow, we imagine that they do touch. Point of contact. <coughs> now, uh, call the green one P ash, PS, that's proto protosphere, and the other is LS, the logosphere. Okay. Now, the logosphere is where human action in the sense of Mises appears. Okay, human action. Okay. And, no, the other one. And logic or reason, better than logic, say reason. They appear for the first time, and it's completely different and outside of the protosphere. Whereas everything else, including geosphere, could you write it on the left, in the left circle, geosphere, and bio, yeah, put, sorry, before you say biosphere, say subhuman. Subhuman, because we take the human beings, of course human beings are also part of the biosphere, aren't we? Yes. We are. But that part of us, which has to do with reason, which has to do with human action, is not in the protosphere. By the way, proto is a Greek uh, 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 Preposition meaning before, earlier. Okay, so that's the early part. And in that development, because what we are really talking about is a hierarchy, the matter appears at higher and higher and higher level. The highest level is the logosphere, but there are lots of levels below. Part of it are human. Uh, could be biological nature or uh, other uh, 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 artistic nature, our uh, inclination to enjoy music or literature or whatever. But what we definitely have to remove from the protosphere is human action and reason. We have the faculty of reasoning. And also, there is a point of contact between the two. And that's what Menger found. And he was working on that. And this is, by the way, also where uh, we leave causality, these, these two words again I ask you, causality, and then put an arrow, causality, and we enter the world of teleology, not theology, T, the, yeah that's it, T, but no age. So this is not theology. <laughs> A lot of people confuse theology and teleology. But they, now, the word teleology is not my invention, of course. Te teleology is that part of uh, philosophy which is opposed to causality, which explains phenomena in terms of 
an ad, somebody, a human being. Of course, uh, teleology was also important in Greek mythology, you know. Uh, but the, the, we are not talking about mythology here, we are talking about human reasoning. A lot of things we cannot explain in terms of causality. We've got to go to teleology, which means we want to search for the ends which human beings choose and then work purposefully to achieve these ends. You see? So you won't understand what is happening if you look for causes, because there aren't any. You've got to find the human being who is working towards a chosen end. And then you then the jigsaw puzzle all falls into place, and you, you get the picture. But if you try to understand the world, without teleology you won't be able to because the jigsaw the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have been shuffled it just doesn't make any sense and you use causality and it's just shuffling more you see even less but as soon as you go to teleology then the pieces fall into place and you get the picture so this is what I'm suggesting here, that the division line between logosphere and everything else is determined by the uh, dichotomy between causality and teleology, these two great principles of philosophy. And human action is specifically a manifestation of teleology. And the main, the main tool of research is teleology. Of course, causality you, you cannot uh, completely exclude because so much of the real world has to do with, with the protosphere. After all, uh, you might be an engineer who's designing a new machine, but a lot of places you would have to use causality because physics, chemistry, and all these other applied sciences are using causality. But causality in itself will not explain how the new machine was born. Because there was a purpose, there was somebody who saw that there's a possibility to go this way and, and uh, do the uh, <coughs> manipulation in the protosphere to get there. So this is a very, very important division line. The, uh, uh, the point of contact between the two spheres, the proto-sphere and the logosphere. And it is the merit of Karl Menger, the uh, father of deductive economics. I don't think I've used this before, but I decided that uh, rather than talking about the father of Austrian economics, which is a kind of uh, uh, false public relation uh, uh, trick, I would call Karl Menger from now on the father of deductive economics, as opposed to inductive. Inductive economics is when you collect statistics and then shuffle them and try to read things into the statistical data which is, I would say, 
90% of economics today. Now, there is some merit to it, but it's completely out of proportion. Because deductive economics, what Menger did, he started from axioms and he deducted various theorems from these axioms, just like the mathematician does, is, is unique and very important, and I would even go so far as suggesting that without the deductive economics, you're just completely illiterate in economics. And, and that's what most of them are, most of the mainstream economists. And I don't mean mainstream Austrians, I, I mean mainstream economists government economists, university, academic economists, economists working for business, they are all what I would call uh, inductive economists. They are just looking at charts, looking at, at uh, statistics and try to read something into them without any sound uh, foundation, which by that I mean the foundation in logic. And that was the great thing what Menger did. Among others, what Menger did was he was looking for contact points between the proto-sphere and the logo sphere. And one such contact point, could you put an arrow to the contact point, as marginalism. This, yeah, marginalism. And I want to explain this. When you work in uh, in the uh, proto-sphere, you, one main method to form a new concept, for example, is the method of averaging. Uh, a new page, please. Method of averaging. So you collect statistics and you have the raw data and out of this you can form concepts using the method of averaging. Now, the number of different averages in mathematics is legion. There is of course the arithmetic average, there is geometric average, there is, or mean, yeah? The same word, the same meaning, and then there is weighted average, there's harmonic average, and just name, you can develop them. And, and they are all useful for certain purposes. But the big uh, insight is that of Mangers, that none of this Mathema these, are, these are all mathematical, but if you go to the logosphere, they are pretty useless, all of them, all these mathematical averages, because what you need is the method of marginalism. And before Menger, there was no such thing. There's no such thing as method of marginalism. There was only averaging for thousands of years. Scientists used the mathematical method of averaging exclusively. Now, what Menger realized is that once you consider reason, human reason, and you consider human action in the sense of Mises. 
then this is unsatisfactory, the method of averaging. It's not going to help. Why? Because very often you end up with false results. The human being who is doing the averaging has reason. So willy-nilly, whether by purpose or by accident, he could read something into the database, thereby falsifying the raw material out of which he wants to draw an average. You see, a machine cannot do that. You, you, your most uh, efficient computer cannot do that. You just make a program that you do the averaging and click and bingo, there it is. But a human being, while doing the cal actual calculation of averages, will be led astray. Now, I'm not saying that it's always malicious, sometimes it could be, but it is just in the nature of the thing that while you do the calculation, you uh, uh, project your ideas into the database, thereby falsified, so the, every, the method of averaging is just out, useless, completely useless in the logo sphere. You've got to have a new method and that new method is called the method of marginalism. Now I don't know if a timetable is published. Yep. What, uh, so we, we have another 20 minutes. We have another, yes. okay, yeah. All right. And after that a break? And yes. No d discussion? Was? No, and that's all at the end of the... Oh, okay. Yeah. So the second, uh, there's a break and break there's a second. Minutes, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, this, I hope I, I got that through. This is a big, big step. A complete revolution in the history of science. A completely new method. <coughs> that of marginalism. Now, the first lesson in marginalism is the concept of marginal utility. The thing is that we have seen, and, and go back to the previous page, and point out that this this co point of contact there, the point of contact, uh, you have red, circle it in red, and say it's marginal, concept of marginal utility. Which was historically the first point of contact between the proto-sphere and the logo-sphere. And this was Menger's work. Now, if you read the theory of economics, you will always, they will always point it out to you that Menger was just one of the three guys who invented it because he, he was the Austrian Menger himself, but there was a Swiss by the name Leon Walras, and there was a an Englishman by the name of Seven. Seven, yeah. yeah. And they share the honor for inventing marginal utility. And I vehemently disagree because what Menger did, he consciously worked on this point of contact between the logosphere and the geosphere. And uh, the other fellows used, uh, I mean, they did useful work, but the concept was uh, uh, really uh, much less important than the concept of Menger, which projected this out as a, as a general method. 
scientific method. <laughs>